All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You can go there in your Bible, continuing the expository study through the book of 2 Timothy. And uh, we're going to talk about chapter 3. Okay, it says here, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Do you ever get the feeling like the world is a ticking time bomb waiting to explode? Yes. You know, are we living in perilous times right now? Yeah. I'll try to keep my coat open here so I don't mess up my microphone. But uh, yeah, things are pretty bad. And uh, we're going to look at these next couple of verses here. are going to mention 19 things. 19 prophecies of these end times that we are in. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So you see there are 19 different things that are all proofs of these end times. That these things, you know, a lot of those things have always been in existence, but those things are going to be amplified and magnified in these end times. So let's look at the first one. How about lovers of their own selves? Did you ever hear of Self Magazine? Yeah. That's a real magazine. And here's a picture of a woman. Her, her name is Nadine. And she actually, you can see there at the ceremony, she's actually marrying herself. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, you can, you can watch the video. She, she went through a ceremony. She had guests, family and friends come. And she had a ceremony where she married herself. And she goes out on dates with herself. And she buys nice things for herself. See, mental illness is what that is. How about the second one there, covetous? Well, what do we have now? We have, you go down the road, you see these big billboards up, advertising all kinds of stuff that you don't need. You know, television ads, which you shouldn't be watching television, you know, and internet ads and, and uh, nice full collar catalogs that come to your house through your mailbox, you know. Uh, again, trying to sell you a lot of things that you probably don't need either. What's going on there? Well, it's very difficult to live without coveting something right now. And it's interesting because all those things I mentioned, billboards and TV ads and internet ads and glossy catalogs and all that, a lot of that stuff didn't even exist 120 years ago. Hmm. You see, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people think that we have things very good right now and and we're just these wimpy little Christians and stuff, and they had it so much more difficult in the past. And in many ways, that's true. But in other ways, it's also we also have things a little bit more difficult today because we're tempted to sin on a level that they wouldn't have even understood back in the first century. You know, the temptations to sin are just all around you. It's incredible. How about boasters? Well, before we talk about that, I just want to tell you, about uh, this past weekend's game. Um, man, I was watching this, my favorite team on uh, television, and man, we just kicked the butt of the, of the, the opposing team. And, and boy, I mean, I think we're gonna go the whole way to the Stuper Bowl this year. You know, huh, what is that? It's boasting. And sports is centered around boasting. We're number one. We're number one. You know, they see they hold these little hands up, these little foam rubber hands, hands and it says one. Number, We're number one, you know. Go team, go. You know. I always, I always have to laugh, you know. You see these uh, people with these vehicles and on the front it says, um, Philadelphia Eagles, number one fan. I think, uh, well, if you're number one, then what about the other guy that has the number one fan on his vehicle, <laughs> you know. There can't be, you know, a thousand number one fans, you know. But just, I get irritated about the funniest things, you know. But the point is, boasters, there are a lot of boasters out there today. How about proud? Kind of ties in hand in hand with boasters. 
Well, you can listen to the sermon, The Sin of Pride, for all the details on why pride is something that's very bad. But uh, America is a very proud nation. And so is the UK and many of the other people, you know, the nations that you're part of. There's a lot of pride. People are too proud to admit that they're sinners. People are too proud to admit that they're on their way to hell. How about blasphemers? Well, here you can see this website, the Blasphemy Challenge. And uh, do you have a soul you're not using? The Rational Response Squad USA. And it has God there with a line through it. You know, And it says here, uh, it's simple. You record a short message damning yourself to hell. You upload it to YouTube and then the Rational Response Squad will send you a free The God Who Wasn't There DVD. It's that easy. It's actually a little fun little game that these foolish little atheists are doing. You know, you get on and you blaspheme the Holy Ghost and then they think that that means that you can't ever be saved after that. Um, which in context, you know, you can listen to the sermon, you know, what is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, I think it's called. Um, it's not even possible right now. So it's kind of funny, they just show their ignorance of Scripture yet again. Atheists are some of the biggest fools out there. I mean, they are the biblical definition of fools. They're just a bunch of little sinners that don't like to have their pet sins rebuked. That's all they are. How about disobedient to parents? Uh, you certainly see that. But here you have a t-shirt, I'll show you a picture of it. Uh, this is put out by uh, Marilyn Manson, the devil that he is. And uh, it says, kill God, kill your mom and dad, kill yourself. That's on his t-shirt. A bunch of other words in there, you know, too. But he's just, you know. And it's funny because when, when a child does this, or you see, have these school shootings or whatever they talk about, why is it that the government never goes after people like this Marilyn Manson? Why is that? Why don't they go after the people who make the violent video games that teach these young people to go out and kill? Why don't they do that? I mean, if I put up a video showing how to make a bomb and somebody watched my video and went out and made that bomb and blew up a bunch of people, I'd go to jail, wouldn't I? I would hope so. Why is it that you can put out how to kill people and how to kill your parents and you just say, well, I'm just entertaining people? And that somehow is acceptable. It's not right. How about unthankful? Well, are you ready for a turkey day coming up this coming? Well, actually, it'll be this month. No, it's called Thanksgiving. And there again, you can, you can listen to our sermon on that. The uh, uh, sacrifice of Thanksgiving, I think it's called. And in that sermon, I actually show you that Thanksgiving was originally started as a day of fasting and prayer here in America. Huh. When did it become a festival of gluttony? Hmm. Interesting. How about unholy? Well, how much holiness is practiced in the average modern church building? Not a whole lot. There's definitely some problems with holiness in our country. Uh, what about without natural affection? Well, take any sodomite out there or child porn or all this other stuff that's going on. Yeah, there's definitely some people that do not have natural affection. Um, little children killing their siblings, you know, um, parents, you know, mothers on Prozac and on other drugs like that that are... Uh, you know, drowning their children to death and beating them to death. I mean, it's it's just sickening. I'm trying to get in a place here where the sunlight's not really getting me. But um, what about truce breakers? Well, how many people keep their word anymore? They make a promise to you. A lot of times they aren't keeping their word. There are truce breakers out there. How about false accusers? Kind of like these new evangelical Christians, you know, the modern Christians, and they falsely accuse King James Bible believers of all sorts of things. You know, you cause division, you know, in the body, in the body of Christ. Uh, well, yeah, that's kind of true in a way because we divide saved from lost. You know, we show people who are saved and who are lost. Uh, but we're not maliciously going out trying to divide people. 
That's not what King James Bible believers do. We have a standard of truth. And people divide over standards of truth. How about incontinent? The twelfth thing that you see there, incontinent. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines incontinent as not restraining the passions or appetites, particularly the sexual appetite, indulging lust without restraint or in violation of law, unchaste, lewd, unable to restrain discharges in the sense of immediate or immediately uh, incontinent, one who is unchaste. And of course, if you want any proof of that, just look at any Hollywood celebrity out there. They are certainly, you know, the definition of incontinent. Any of them. How about fierce? Well, here you have a picture of the, the bloods, I think, is what that one is there. And these, this one here is a Mexican uh, gang. And these people are fierce. And, of course, there's all kinds of other fierce groups out there. There's some people that are very, very just devil-possessed, just wicked. How about the next one? Despisers of those that are good. There you go. How about uh, these people coming out with all these hate crime laws? You know, trying to silence Bible-believing Christians. What are they? Despisers of those that are good. How about traitors? Yeah, there are certainly uh, some people that were formerly conservative Christians, and now they've joined the ranks of the enemies of God. Yep, there are certainly lots of traitors out there. How about heady? This is an interesting one. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines heady as rash, hasty, precipitate, violent, disposed to rush forward in an enterprise without thought or deliberation, hurried on by will or passion, ungovernable. All the talent required is to be heady, to be violent on one side or the other, apt to affect the head, inflaming, intoxicating, strong, as spiritus, liquors, champagne, champagne as a heady wine, violent impetus as a heady current not usual. Yeah, there are certainly some people out there that uh, are very heady. Again, high-minded. And it's this one's another good one. You get somebody high-minded, um, I would define that as somebody who's college-educated. You know, And it's funny because we have more college-educated people today than ever before in American history, and yet we have more problems, less job opportunities, you know, I thought college education was supposed to give you a better job, but it doesn't. All it gives you is a better debt, or bigger debt, I should say. Um, and, of course, you have evolution philosophy. It goes against the known laws of science, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, and yet people believe evolution. Why? Well, because they're high-minded. They want to think that they have evolved and that they're more intelligent than people were in the past. Uh, quite the opposite is true. Um, number 18 there, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And uh, how many Christians spend hours studying the Word of God anymore? Uh, how many, if, if we broke down the amount of time that you read God's Word, would it amount to a couple hours a week? That's really something. And uh, let me ask you a really pressing question, and this is one I'm kicking myself again. If we looked at your YouTube watch history, how much of that would be spent on watching, preaching, or things about the Lord, or things that can be used for the Lord? Are you coming to YouTube for entertainment? The Bible says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We as a society love to be entertained. We love to have good times. We like to have fun. And I'm not against good times or fun, but when it's a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God, then yeah, it's a problem. How about the 19th one there? Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. You know, what are lost people? that are professing, false professing Christians. They have a form of godliness. They know the right things to say. They know how to act. They go to church, even though that doesn't even appear in the Bible. And, uh, but what do they have? They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. 
That's very interesting because what's the power of Christianity? The Holy Spirit. So they deny the Holy Spirit. Hmm. You know, a lot, I know a lot of people try to make that thing into just a carnal Christian that has a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. I think it's talking about false converts. Somebody that, that has a form of godliness. They might look like a Christian, but they denied the Holy Spirit of truth. They don't want anything to do with the Holy Spirit of truth. Okay? You look at their lives, they're not bearing fruit. Hmm. So what do you do with these people when you run around these, the, when you get around this type of people? What do, you, what do you do with them? Well, the Bible says, from such turn away. It doesn't say get in there among them and try to, you know, be cool with them and try to, you know, relate to them on their level. From such turn away. Remember that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. For of this sort, all the people in that list there, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Okay, 1 Timothy 5, verses 14 uh, and 15 says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. There are silly women out there who are not spending their time wisely and uh, they are easy prey for the false prophets. And it's a shame. A lot of times they don't have a strong spiritual man. It's why you need to really pray before you get married, ladies. And why you really need to think about your responsibilities if you are a saved man to the men out there. 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Proverbs 18, verse 2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. That's why the majority of people, lost people, go off to their college. Because they want to discover their own heart. They don't want, when their heart convicts them and says, hey, that's wrong, they want to try to find a way that they can educate themselves out of that conviction. They can say, well, says who? That's what the majority of atheists do today. They try to educate themselves out of belief in God so that they can sin without a conscience. That's what they're doing. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, Now is touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. If you don't know God, if you're not loved of God, then you really don't know anything. Okay? And you say, but I have, you know, I'm ever learning. I'm continuing to my education. Oh, then you're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus Christ is the source of all truth. If you reject him, then all you're doing is just trying to discover your own heart. Fool. <laughs> That's the way, what the Bible teaches. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The thing that will happen to you if you go off to some college somewhere, you will be spoiled through philosophy. You know what something spoiled is? It's something that's rotten. That's no good. You throw it out. That's what the Lord thinks of you if you go off to some college someplace. He looks at you and goes, ugh, spoiled, yuck. Turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. We'll continue here. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 7. Two men are given there as an example of people who resist the truth. 
and it says that they are men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. These people that reject the truth of the Bible are doing so because they're trying to discover their heart. And they're foolish. Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Sun should be going down pretty soon here. Um, it says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, uh, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord commanded, had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Do you realize what you just read there? Did you know that there are magicians who, by the power of Satan, I would assume, um, are able to also perform miracles, miraculous things? Get back here out of the sun again. And you have these magicians, and they're copying the works of the Lord. But now I want you to realize something interesting. There in Exodus chapter 7, are these magicians named? No. How did Paul realize that their names were Janus and Jambres? Did you know that those two names there, this is the only time that they appear in the entire King James Bible? Who told Paul the names of these magicians? Uh, well, Moses did because Moses was there at the time of the writing of the New Testament, right? No. Moses had been dead for thousands of years. Who told Paul the names of two lost magicians that were dead for thousands of years? The Lord did. That's how you know that your King James Bible is inspired of God. One of many ways that you can know. But you see, God knows everybody's name. From the beginning of creation, the whole way up until the end. You say, hey, uh, uh, God, could you name me ten people that uh, died in the flood in the days of Noah? You can't name ten people. God can. You know, God knows all their names, not just ten. He knows everybody's name. He knows everything about everybody. And there, the Lord's inspiring these scriptures to Paul, and he says, oh yeah, Janus and Jambres. And Paul's probably like, huh, I read those stories in Exodus a bunch of times. I never knew their names. That's interesting. See? We serve an amazing God. We don't serve a little false God like Muhammad or Allah, the moon God, or Buddha or Confucius or some of these other pagan deities. You know, uh, we serve an amazing God, a God that can know two men's names that died thousands of years earlier. Just thought that was interesting. Second Timothy chapter three, verse nine. It says here, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now the ultimate fulfillment of this is going to be at the rapture. Because what happens at the rapture is, and this is only the second time in history that this is going to happen, all saved people are leaving at the rapture. There won't be, well, the some saved go and some, save, some of the saved stay. Uh-uh. For the first time in history, the very first time that this happened in history was with Noah. Noah gets on the ark and the flood comes in. Everybody gets wiped out, but Noah, you know, and his three sons, Noah and his wife and their, you know, his three sons and their, their wives. Okay, so you have that time. But this time at the rapture, you're actually going to have all the saved people are going to leave. Everybody that's left on the earth after the rapture, they're all going to be lost. All of them. There's going to be a lot of self-righteous people that thought that they were saved, but they're going to be here proving that they're lost. Hmm. Okay. What's going on there? Their folly shall be manifest unto all men. The ultimate folly. You know. I mean, it's going to be covered up in the media, but I think it's going to be kind of funny. 
you know, you ask the average person out there in the world who the ultimate Christian is, many of them think the Pope is the ultimate Christian. Well, at the rapture, guess what? Old Pope Francis, you know, is going to be sitting over there in the Vatican, you know, getting ready to help the Antichrist come to power. <laughs> you know, his folly is going to be manifest to all men. Along with all the other, a lot of his followers and a lot of the preachers and stuff out there. Their folly is going to be manifest to all men. Hmm. Continuing, verse 10 and 11 here. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. You see, Timothy knew what Paul was going through. Uh, there was some really bad stuff that Paul had been through and, you know, a lot of the persecution and everything there. Timothy knew about it. And you say, what's the purpose of talking about stuff like that? Well, we'll see it here. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. It says here, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that, by, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Hmm. You know, sometimes as a Christian, when you start getting kicked around and the brethren watch you and they see your strength in that, it can actually lead them to do bold things on their own. I'll tell you a little story, and I've told this in other sermons before, but it's one that's really just, it, ex it was a great exhortation to me. Way back there in the Dark Ages, well, I guess should, I should say in the Reformation years, which is kind of after the Dark Ages, um, there was a man, and he had been taken in to prison by the Catholics, by the Inquisition, and I don't remember what the man's name was right now, but uh, he had gone in, and they were trying to get him to recant, and he would not recant. They were torturing him and all kinds of stuff, would not recant. And uh, they said, okay, we're going to burn you at the stake. He said, okay, I will not recant. I will not deny Jesus Christ, you know. And uh, his friends came to visit him in the prison, and they were like, you know, they're going to burn you. What are you going to do? And he was like, I'm not going to recant. I refuse. I will not recant. And, they, and he said, I believe that God is going to preserve me through the fire. I don't believe I'm going to feel the flames when I'm burned at the stake. And they were like, you know, well, that'd be really neat if that was true. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, when I'm being burned at the stake, he said, if I feel the, the heat of the flames, then, you know, it'll just be that. But he said, if I don't feel the heat of the flames, he said, I'll clap my hands three times. And they, you know, okay. So the next day or whenever it was that he was taken out to be executed, they chained him, you know, so that his arms were free, they chained him around the chest to the stake, and then they piled all the wood around him, and they burned him. And they watched. His friends were watching from the crowd. They were watching and watching and watching. And his body was just totally engulfed in flames and, and burning up. And uh, he didn't clap his hands. And they thought, oh, no. And they said that uh, when the corpse, when this body was just about almost totally burned so that it was almost unrecognizable. Just like this. They said all of a sudden he raised his hands up above his head like this and went like that. He didn't feel the flames. Just like he said. The Lord delivered him in that time period. You know what that does? It makes you bold. You hear stuff like that. I'm going to tell you something. I myself, I haven't been burned at the stake yet, as you can tell. But I'll tell you what, I've gone through some persecution. I've had people threaten me. I've had some weird things that have happened to me and stuff. Uh, spiritual things and, and some really odd things. But you know what? The Lord's delivered me through every single one of those things. And I can tell you, when you start to serve the Lord and you stop caring what people think about you, 
the Lord will pay, he'll pull you through some amazing, amazing things. You will see the power of the Lord working in your life. Not this charismatic power, you know, stuff where you, you get a check for $50,000, you know, be, and then you bought yourself a brand new BMW or something. Not that stuff. I'm talking about real, true, divine appointments where the Lord will send you someplace and you'll go through it and you'll come out and you go, whoa, I can't believe that. I had a brother write to me recently here and, and uh, I won't say his name because I don't know if you want to be named about this brother, but it's amazing. He was out handing out tracks at a rock and roll concert and he said he sees this guy and he's like, oh, I should give him a track. Ah, I don't, I, I got to get going, you know. And, and he, went and he went to get on his bike to go home and he thought, oh, I really need to give that guy a track. Went back, handed the guy a gospel track. The guy took it and he said he went home. You know, okay, mission accomplished. Gets home and he's like, that guy really looked familiar. Huh, I just, something, something about that guy just looked familiar. And he got online and he looked at, at who the different bands were that were at this rock concert or heavy metal concert, you know. And he said, here he realized this guy that he gave a track to was one of the band members. You know, amazing. I mean, what an amazing opportunity from the Lord. You know, see, the Lord will do those types of things for you. The Lord will open up divine appointments for you. It's, it's an amazing thing. And see, those are the types of stories that it's good to share with some of the brethren and just say, hey, you know, we serve a living God. Our God can do amazing things through your life. Just incredible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, all, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall never be persecuted. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. Um, shall make lots of money. No. Shall be in perfect health. No. Um, you know. <laughs> no, it says uh, they shall suffer persecution there. Shall suffer persecution. You will be persecuted for Jesus Christ. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 20 through 26. Okay, it says here, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now it's one of the most interesting things that you'll ever experience is when you get attacked for your stands for Jesus Christ. And you're not in the wrong. You know, it's one thing if you're doing wrong and somebody rebukes you and, you know, that's one thing. But it's another thing entirely. Some geese going over right now. I don't know if you can hear that or not. But uh, Canadian geese. Um, it's another thing entirely when you are doing right and somebody attacks you and they try to put you down. I remember when my wife and I went through this uh, thing where we were called on the carpet at the last uh, Baptist Phallus house that we were going to. And we were called all kinds of things, rebels and all this other stuff. And it was just like, I kept saying, uh, what's your scripture for this? Well, I can't point to a, a specific verse, but I know you're wrong. And I was just like, <laughs> you can't show me from scripture that I'm wrong and yet I'm wrong. I'm sorry, I don't submit to that, you know. And we got through this whole thing and we left. You know, we're driving back to our place where we were staying at that point in time. And we both just started laughing. <laughs> I mean, just laughing uncontrollably, just just giggling, you know. 
just we had so much joy. We, I mean, we, I literally felt like leaping for joy. You know, why? Persecuted for righteousness' sake. Persecuted for our stands that we were taking. You know, and you'll get that. You'll get somebody that comes out, you stupid fanatic, and they're yelling at you and whatever else. It'll, it'll give you a feeling of joy. It really will. It's a great feeling. So don't don't uh, worry about people kicking you around if you're doing right. But uh, back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Okay, it says here, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. All right? Now, there again, people say the King James Bible is not scientific. Yes, it is. That's a known law of science. You say, what is it? The second law of thermodynamics. The law of entropy. The law of change. In a closed system, things get worse with time. Okay? You see this? See that? That's a leaf. You know what's going to happen to this? I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to put this in my house and I'm going to set it there on top of the bookshelf and this thing in a year from now is going to be solid gold. Right? No. It's going to be a dried up little shriveled leaf there, probably moldy and whatever else. Why? It gets worse with time. Okay? Unless God steps in and intervenes, things in this world get worse with time. They don't get better. And the Bible there says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, I think, I th I think right now things are bad in the world, Brian, but I think we're headed for revival. <laughs> you're foolish. I'm sorry to tell you, you're foolish. If you think that we're heading for revival, you have been deceived. All right? You're one of the you know, deceiving and being deceived people. We're not headed for spiritual renewal or revival. Uh, the body of Christ leaves in an apostate condition, not in a renewed, revived condition. All right? Don't forget that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, did... Did the verse say there that we're to change and update our beliefs to fit into modern society? No. Um, but we should, we should change so that we keep our numbers up, right? No. Uh, it doesn't say that. It says that we are to continue in the things that we have learned and have been assured of. You know one of the things that irritates me more than just about anything else out there? When I see a Christian that's solidly King James Bible believing and all of a sudden some liar comes out like James White or something and they bring up one verse and this person sees it and they go, what am I going to do? I have to drop all my beliefs. Just because you can't explain something right away doesn't mean you drop your beliefs. Hey, have you learned that this King James Bible is God's pure, perfect word? then continue in that belief. Continue in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of. All right? You believe in eternal security because you've seen the scriptures behind it. Somebody comes out and says, yes, but what about this argument? Or what about that verse? Or what about this? Oh, I'm going to drop all my beliefs because I have, here's a thing I can't answer. Don't do that. Continue in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Don't back down on stuff like that. Somebody comes to you and they give you a, a what about this, you know? And if they're saved, you know, if they're lost, well, then avoid foolish and unlearned questions because they gender strifes. But if it's a saved person, or at least professing Christian, you know, what you do is you just simply say, well, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. I'll find the answer for you, you know? But don't quit on your beliefs simply because somebody brings up a point or two that you can't answer. Don't do that. Okay? And, you know, what's the verse right before that one? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there's going to be more and more deception. There's going to be more and more attacks on the things that you've learned and have been assured of. Don't back down. 
let's look at the last three verses here in the chapter, verses 15 through 17. It says here, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, there's a bunch of things that we need to notice from these three verses. Okay, first of all, in verse 15, Paul says that Timothy had the holy scriptures from a child. All right? And it goes on to say, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So, in context, are scriptures original autographs only, or are they copies of original autographs? Copies. Unless Timothy had all the original autographs in one volume there from the time he was a child. I don't think so. Timothy had copies of scriptures. And yet they still have the same mark of inspiration of God upon them. You know, it's been well said that you have something like peaches and you get some a guy that has them on the tree. You pick the peach off the tree. Is it a peach? Yes. You take that peach in and you can that peach. Now you hold up the, the canned peaches and you say, this is now a squiggly bob or something. No. You say it's a peach. It's still a peach. You say, well, it's changed since the original. Yes, I know that. But it's still a peach. See? The Word of God, this isn't what they had in the first century. I'm well aware of that. I don't believe that they were carrying around King James Bibles. They, didn't, they weren't that fortunate. They weren't that blessed. Okay? They didn't have the whole Bible in an easy to read volume like this. I think that they would have been very happy to have had it. You know, this King James Bible is superior to what they had. <gasps> oh no. Oh, that's awful. No, it's not. Because you see, this is the one that's preserved. Those original autographs that they had, you know, kind of like the peach that came off the tree. The peach that comes off the tree, you set that on your shelf, guess what? It rots. It fades away. It goes away. You take that preserved peach, you know, the one that's canned, and you put that thing on your shelf and you let it sit there and it'll stay there indefinitely. As long as the seal's not broken, that thing will sit there for years and years and years and still be just as good as when you first canned it. You know what I mean? You say, oh, Brother Ryan, I, I can't believe you two would say that against the originals. How dare you speak against the original, verbally inspired, you know, plenary, whatever, all this stuff, original autographs. Uh, well, I'll speak it, because it's the truth. Uh, I'm not too worried about the original autographs. You know, they're gone. Okay, they were not preserved. Uh, God's Word was preserved down through the centuries, you know, and we have it today in the King James Bible for English-speaking people something to think about there. But you see there in that passage that Paul calls copies of Scripture that Timothy had access to as a child, he calls them inspired in verse 16. But notice there there are four reasons, four purposes of Scripture given. Number one, there in verse 16, you have doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Okay? That's the fourfold reason or the fourfold purpose of Scripture, why you were given Scripture. So you don't just say, well, only the Pauline epistles. Okay, that's hyperdispensationalism. I don't teach that, I never have. I speak against that. All right. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine. There are doctrines that will carry over between dispensations. Okay? There are certain things doctrinally will be true for everybody. But you have to rightly divide, you see. How about reproof? The things that are written before time were written for our learning. Okay? The things that are back in the Old Testament you can use to reprove people today and correct people today. Those two things kind of go hand in hand. Reproof and correction. You can use the whole Bible for reproof and correction. How about instruction and righteousness? Are there things in the Old Testament that we can learn from that can instruct us in righteousness? Oh, yeah. You know, one of my favorite books of the Bible, probably my favorite 
whole book of the Bible there, as far as the whole thing. I have certain verses in the New Testament that I really like. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2 is probably my favorite chapter in the New Testament. But as far as a whole book of the Bible, my favorite book is Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. You say, well, Brian, it's written doctrinally to a Jew in the Old Testament. I know that. But instruction in righteousness, it is phenomenal for today. Very, very, very true. And there's a lot of doctrine in it, too. That's just as good today as it was for the Jew in the Old Testament. So that's the purpose of Scripture. But notice there in verse 17, it says there that the man of God may be perfect. Now, I actually heard some modern version preacher the one time, and he was like, you know, the King James is an error because it says that a man can be perfect. And we know that no, no man is perfect but Jesus Christ. Well, that's true in terms of, you know, living a sinless life. But the reality of it is, the Bible does teach that there is a way that you can be perfect. You say, how's that? Well, turn to James chapter 3, verse 2. And again, you know, I teach James is for the tribulation saint, uh, the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. But instruction in righteousness, this is definitely true for anybody. James chapter 3, verse 2. It says here, For in many things we offend all. Very true. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. You know where sin starts? Right there. If you could get control of your mouth and watch, you know, the, even Jesus Christ talked about it, the things which proceed out of the man's mouth are what defile him. If you can get control of this right here, you could be perfect. What did the Bible say about Jesus Christ? It says that there was no guile found in his mouth. He was a perfect man. Why? Because he never said anything out of here that was wrong. And let me just say it this way, brethren. The more Scripture comes out of your mouth, the more you quote Scripture in every situation that you get into, the closer you'll be to that stature, the full stature of Jesus Christ, coming to the full stature of a perfect man. You say, but Brian, you'll never get to that point. Well, you should aim for it. Okay, if you are always aiming to do your very best, always aiming to be perfect, you know, you're just going to get better and better and better with things. And what you need to do as a Christian is hide this book in your heart. Read and study this King James Bible so that it becomes part of you and where you're just speaking Scripture all the time. People ask you for advice. You say, well, the Bible says, you know, um, what do you think about this? Well, the Bible says, you know, Scripture, 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 Scripture. And Jesus Christ, being God manifest in the flesh, every word that that man spoke was God's Word. <laughs> Literally, God's Word. That's why he was perfect. And if you get to a point where you speak God's Word, you're heading towards perfection. You know? where you are solely speaking the Word of God out of your mouth. Now, you know, I mean, you're not going to be able to, to quote Scripture for every instance or something like that. I mean, somebody says, you know, uh, what month is your, is your uh, car inspection run out or something like that? Well, you can't give them a verse of Scripture for that. Uh, you know, I understand that. I'm just saying, you know, the way that you head towards a you know, as little sin as possible in your life, the way you do that is by learning Scripture and living by the Word of God. So, that's going to be it for Second Timothy chapter 3. Uh, another great chapter certainly proves that the King James Bible is true. If you watched last uh, week's study, Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, I talked about how that um, this one preacher... Uh, said the one time about how that uh, you know somebody asked him how would you prove the word of God to be you know truly inspired and given by God and he was like oh I can't answer that that's too much too much detail and of course that's really not that difficult of a question to answer in reality because the answer is how can you prove this book is God's word simple 
it shouldn't be limited to time because a perfect God that lives outside of this world, that lives outside of time, he shouldn't have his book constrained to one period. Like you get Muhammad, you know, his stupid Quran that he inspired from a 600 winged angel, devil in other words. Muhammad couldn't prophesy two days ahead in the future. Muhammad can't prophesy anything to save his life. And of course, he didn't save his life. He's in hell right now, burning down there be below our feet. You know, hey, Muhammad, you know, how's it going down there? <laughs> we'll see him at the Great White Throne Judgment. But um, any false religious book will not be able to prophesy the future. Your King James Bible here is a great book because it was written when things were a lot different than they are. A lot of these new versions, you know, they're, they were written 10, 20 years ago. Well, there's no impressive thing to that at all. I mean, they're written when things have gotten bad. They're written during the great falling away. You know, obviously because they're what's called calling, causing, excuse me, causing the great falling away. But the fact is, there's nothing really impressive. You know, see, they say, you know, things are going to get bad. Things, you know, Israel's going to be reborn as a nation. People can look at it and say, yeah, you know, it was written 30 years after Israel became a nation. 40, 50 years after Israel became a nation. There's nothing impressive about that. But you get a book that's written in 1611. And this book says, hey, Israel's going to be reborn as a nation. It's going to happen in one day. And it happens. Hey, in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Proud. Blasphemers. You know, it goes down through. And you can look and you can say, wow, look at that. Everything that this King James Bible said was going to happen is happening. And it was written over 400 years ago. That's impressive. That proves to me that this is God's book. You know, sometimes it's not very much fun to look out at this world and to see how things are getting so bad. But then when you look at it through the lens of prophecy and you say this, these bad things that are happening out there in the world actually confirm this book. Actually tell me that this book is from God Almighty. It doesn't seem so bad after all. It actually gives you hope. And you say, yeah, you know, I can look around through nature. I can look out here and I can see this and stuff. And I can say, there had to be a creator. This couldn't have happened by chance. But I can know for a fact that this creator, the one who created all of this out here, I can know that he's speaking to me through this book right here, this old King James Bible, because it accurately tells me what is coming in the future. It's an amazing book. Quite a book. And uh, the things that you've learned here at this ministry, the things that you've learned from other ministries out there, continue in those things. Don't back down. Again, part of the evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, part of that thing is as times go continue to increase and things get worse and worse, uh, more and more people are going to back off. I don't believe that there's going to be a great revival of people coming you know, to the pre-trib rapture belief. I believe the opposite is going to be true. Um, my channel does not have the influence of some of these other false prophets that are attacking the pre-trib rapture belief system. It's just going to get worse and worse as time goes by. You better continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of. And if you have doubts or questions or something like that, contact me. I'll try to get back to you. Uh, right now is kind of a rough time because we're moving and everything. Um, but uh, don't give up on your beliefs. Okay. Uh, stick by it. So that's going to be it for this week. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And we will see you next week for our chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4 study. So that's it. Thank you.